Firstly, just thank you again for your time and for joining me today as we outline our finances uh, and look at the impact of the past year in the IRFU. Um, and I know we circulated information earlier, which you have, but there's just a few headline points I think that I, I wanted to make sure that uh, um, you, you were on top of. Um, as you already know, the union, in common with many organisations, uh, unfortunately suffered very heavy losses uh, uh, over the past year, 18 months. Um, the accounts of 31st July 2021 show a deficit of 10 million, uh, and that comes on the back of a deficit of uh, uh, 36 million in the preceding 15 months. Uh, it was a 15 month year because we changed our year end. Um, that deficit arose after providing funding of over 27 million uh, to our four provinces and 4 million to our clubs. Uh, and. Uh, in, es in essence, to keep them solvent. Um, there's nothing different uh, than any of the other uh, major sporting organisations in this country have had to face over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, I can report that income actually increased from 79.2 million uh, to 84 million despite the absence of meaningful gate receipts um, and uh, amortised uh, income compared to last year. And that's due uh, primarily to TV monies in respect of the two postponed Six Nations matches which were subsequently played in October 2020, in other words, outside of the previous financial year, uh, taken into this financial year. Um, we also received 13.2 million uh, from the CVC deal uh, in relation to the Pro 14 stroke United Rugby Championship. Um, and then we also received uh, a special government uh, assistance grant of 18.2 million, together with other government funding in terms of wage subsidies uh, and, and other new initiatives. Um, and I have to thank the government uh, for, the, for the, the support that they've given, uh, not only to the IRFU, but to many other sporting organisations. I think without it, we'd be having a very different conversation here today. Um, our commercial partners, uh, including Vodafone uh, and Canterbury, have been super. Um, they've uh, supported us uh, all throughout the, the, the crisis. Um, and I want to take uh, uh, this opportunity to thank them most sincerely for that. And again, uh, their help and their support uh, is, is hugely appreciated. Um, in the provinces, income was up by 5.5 million um, on last year, but this figure includes the 13.2 million uh, uh, euro in terms of the CVC monies. In other words, it passed straight through the union, straight to the provinces uh, in order to keep them solvent. Um, EBCR income uh, was down last year um, uh, and uh, due to cancellations, uh, the lack of attendances um, uh, and so uh, we took a big hit uh, in terms of uh, our normal provincial income uh, in, in, in that space. Amortised income uh, fell drastically last year due to the absence of fans in the Aviva Stadium and as a result no five or ten year tickets uh, or corporate box income was, uh, was effectively taken in as amortised income. Um, all of our patrons have had a, a year added to their contracts, uh, to their 10-year contracts. Um, and again, we have to thank them for their forbearance. Um, it's been tricky for them. Uh, and uh, again, we've had huge support from our uh, premium seat holders um, and our box holders, uh, for which we're very grateful. Professional game costs increased by almost 20 million to just over 68 million. Um, over the summer of 2020, a bailout package was put together made up of special COVID grants of over 14 million, together with an agreement to use all CVC monies received in respect of the Pro 14 for the benefit of the four branches in the form of grants and credits against recharge amounts due to the union. Uh, and that makes up that figure of 27 million, which I spoke about earlier. Uh, the union's reserves uh, have halved effectively uh, since pre COVID. Uh, Pre-COVID, coming into COVID, we had a balance sheet with reserves of about 98 million. Our reserves today uh, are 52 million. Uh, and that just shows the impact that COVID has had on the, the financial well-being uh, of Irish rugby. Those reserves were built up over 147 years. Uh, uh, and that's what's happened. Uh, so, in summary, the government funding... The CVC and CVC monies have really been pretty instrumental in keeping Irish rugby on the road throughout this crisis. Uh, even with this, however, uh, the union has seen, as I say, its reserves take a right hammering, um, and they've halved in almost two years. Accordingly, it's been necessary for the union to reduce its cost base by 10% uh, across the board, um, and that's a permanent reduction unless we can see significant increases 
in revenues that will bring us up, up above and beyond the pre-COVID uh, revenue levels. Um, and unfortunately and regrettably, that uh, involved various, uh, both a compulsory redundancy programme and a voluntary redundancy programme, um, which uh, was tough uh, and uh, something which uh, we undertook, uh, we didn't undertake lightly. Um, but it was something that I had to do. The branches are in exactly the same position. Uh, they've had to reduce uh, their budgets uh, accordingly and have had uh, similar redundancy programmes um, uh, in their organisations. As things stand, we're permitted to have up to 100% attendances at our matches. However, it would be unwise to assume that we have seen the pack of COVID, uh, and I think uh, we're witnessing that probably at the moment uh, in terms of... Uh, a surge in, in, in numbers. Um, if further, if um, full attendances are curtailed again uh, in the in the future, uh, that's going to require uh, you know further actions by the provinces and by the union in terms of uh, uh, managing our finances. And hopefully that won't happen, um, but it's uh, not beyond the realms of possibility. Um, we have to rebuild our balance sheet. Um, over the coming years to ensure that we have a stable and viable financial base for the game and that will be our intention. So in conclusion it's been a, a pretty challenging year. Um, I don't think anyone uh, particularly wants to go through it again uh, but it's, uh, we have come out the other end in reasonable shape um, but I think uh, it depends on a lot of factors uh, in terms of COVID and hopefully we can manage COVID as a, as a society and uh, keep the show on the road. And that's, that's the key issue, I think. Great, thanks, Philip. Um, there's no hands up function today, obviously, because we're not, uh, we're not uh, on screen. But uh, I think everybody kind of generally goes in the same order. So we'll start off with Mike, if that's all right. <laughs> if we can keep it to two questions, just to start, if we find at the end, we'll come back, obviously, uh, as in about 12 minutes uh, in each section. situation that you know this week the week of a, of a big international weekend with the women playing the USA and uh, the men playing New Zealand um, as a CEO of the RFU the situation where the director of sevens and women's rugby became embroiled in a controversial scenario with current and past members of the, um, the women's rugby team I mean that certainly doesn't paint the RFU in a, in a, pretty, in a pretty good way yeah, listen, it's been a tough week. Um, uh, and it's a tough week for anyone who loves Irish rugby. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we share the disappointment uh, that the players and the team management uh, have gone through. Um, uh, and by we, I mean uh, we in the IRFU, we, uh, the volunteers all around the country who are involved in uh, developing and promoting uh, and delivering uh, rugby for girls in, in clubs and schools um, and, the, and the committees. Um, we are all 100% behind the women's game um, and maybe that doesn't seem evident, uh, but we are. Um, and we're committed to making sure that the women's game succeeds, that it develops uh, and that we address whatever issues there are uh, in relation to the, uh, the women's game. Uh, I think when you reflect on what has happened over the last uh, over the last week, uh, there's there's two probably key issues or questions. Uh, the first one is the question around what happened in Parma, and the second question is uh, how is the women's game structured uh, and developing, and is it structured in the right way to ensure that the development of the women's game uh, proceeds at a pace. Um, and in both cases we've already put the review structures in place uh, to effectively try and find the answers to those questions. Um, and uh, we're committed to answering those questions and we're committed to, to acting on whatever the outcome of those reviews are. Um, I don't have answers to the questions. Um, uh, I think we're best to leave it to the uh, independent uh, review uh, in both aspects um, uh, to, to actually come up with uh, the reports. Uh, those reports will get a full consideration 
Uh, and I think the key outcomes and the key findings of those reports will uh, be made public as we normally do. And I think the, the key thing here is, is that there's the independence of the reports uh, is important. Um, and the people who are doing those reports are well qualified uh, to do it. Amanda Bennett and Fair Play as her consultancy. Uh, Kevin Bowring, who you, you'll know as a, uh, as a, a former international coach uh, and has been involved in high performance for many, many years. And Helen Phillips, who's been in high performance uh, in the Commonwealth Games uh, and in other sports. And is, so I think we have a good team uh, looking at the uh, question about what happened in Parma. And what happened in terms of the preparation and the participation uh, uh, of the team um, in that uh, competition and prior to that competition. Um, and that's, uh, a, a pre a, that review goes back to 2020, March 2020. So it's taking in that, that whole span of preparation. Uh, so my own view on this is uh, we can have lots of chatter um, about what it was or what it wasn't or how we develop the game or how we don't develop the game, I'd actually prefer to see the outcome of these reports. Um, I think they will be good reports. I think everyone's committed to making sure that they uh, are, are done properly uh, and that ultimately that the outcome of those reports is taken to the Union Committee uh, and acted on. Um, because at the end of the day, if we don't, uh, we're going to continue to struggle uh, in terms of developing the game uh, for girls and for women uh, and we'll continue to struggle at the top end of the game in terms of the international team. And do you see the outcome um, of, these, of these two um, conversations that are on way at the moment, do you see that as the perfect opportunity to implement what are the findings are of both, um, both, both the investigations of the World Bank as well as the world? Um, with a view to having a much, much stronger women's game going forward. And perhaps having a debate now that probably should have uh, uh, taken place a couple of years ago. To be fair, we, we do have a, 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 women's, uh, a women's action plan. And, and we actually, the, just as a, to demonstrate the level of importance that we attach to the women's game in, in Irish rugby and in the IRFU, we actually have a strategy within a strategy. Uh, which is there for everyone to see. It's, it's on our website if you want to look at it, if you haven't seen it. Uh, and it's a fairly detailed plan as to how we try and uh, um, progress the development uh, of, the, of the women's game. Um, there's no doubt that uh, we have to look at the structures, review the structures. We have to review the access points into the pathway. Um, it's not necessarily the same as the men's game. Um, uh, and a lot of uh, girls come to the game late, much later than the, than the boys. Uh, and so we have to take all of that into account. And that's the purpose of the, the wider ranging review that Amanda Bennett is carrying out, uh, which is to effectively take that women in action, the, the women's action plan, review it against uh, uh, what uh, people feel needs to be done, um, uh, and update it in the context of uh, the fact that we've really been static for nearly two years now because of COVID, uh, and it's only recently that we've, uh, we were back active again in, in the in the amateur club game. Um, so I'm, I have every confidence in Amanda and her team in terms of uh, uh, reviewing what we're doing, uh, consulting with the people who need to be consulted with, uh, and that includes everyone from players to administrators. Uh, and I'm confident that there's a commitment by the IRFU uh, to make sure that the, the women's game is put on the best possible footing to develop as quickly as is possible or practical. And in, in many respects, there's no instant easy answers. We can't conjure up uh, something out of nothing. It takes time to develop the game. It takes time to develop players. Uh, and there has been some great work done. Uh, and sometimes that's lost. Uh, and uh, there's great work done by our volunteers. There's great work done by our development staff around the country and by the provinces, um, and we shouldn't forget that either. Um, and it's obviously very disheartening uh, for, for, for those people, 
um, you know, to uh, you know, in terms of the, the criticism that's 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 out there. But at the end of the day, if the criticism is deserved, uh, uh, we have to take it on the chin and we have to uh, move on and make sure that we move on in the right direction. And that's the purpose of the two reports. Thank you. Hi, Phil. Um, not only in light of my husband's speech, but because you know, the action plan you mentioned there, because of um, the failure to reach a lot of those targets in the RFP's action plan, um, is Anthony Eddy's position as First Government would be untenable? Look, I mean, we're facing into we're facing into two big matches um, uh, this week uh, this week and next week uh, for the girls in terms of uh, the U.S. and Japan. Um, and my own view on this and it, it is what it is, but it's my view is that it's, it'd be totally inappropriate and you know it'll be just plain wrong for me uh, to be adding any comments that are going to distract the team from doing uh, what they need to do, which is, you know, focus and prioritise uh, what's immediately in front of them, which is these two matches. Uh, we're behind the team 100% uh, and hopefully they'll deliver the performances uh, uh, that uh, will, will deliver results uh, for them, and uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, I'm f and as I said, you know, I'm fully aware of those issues. I'm fully aware of uh, the uh, different views and opinions that are out there. Um, and. The independent reviews have been put in place and are up and running to actually answer those questions. Uh, and so I really don't think it's appropriate um, for me to make comments that are only going to be a distraction uh, ultimately to what the key focus must be this week and next week, which is effectively the performances uh, on the pitch and that provide no distraction uh, for, the, for the team. I think they, they, they deserve that. They deserve our support and they, de they, de they deserve a distraction-free period just to concentrate on, 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 on the difficulty of you know, performing at the highest level uh, against two good teams in terms of US and Japan. It was Anthony Eddie's comments that created those distractions and RFP employees. What, I, what I'd say again, Sinead, and I, you know, please don't get me wrong, but I honestly feel that for me to get involved uh, in a discussion around team management when the team is trying to prepare for two major fixtures, it's just wrong. Um, and it's not going to assist the team in any way. I'm really not going to make any further comment on that. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, I, I think there's probably uh, more to go, uh, a greater distance to go. We we changed our laws and our uh, governance structure um, and part and parcel of that is that each province is entitled now to uh, up to four uh, delegates um, on the IRFU committee but what we've stipulated is that at least one of those uh, uh, delegates must be uh, must be female um, and we've given them a period of three years to actually get to that position. Two provinces have now put on female delegates and the other two I hope will follow fairly shortly. Um, and uh, I think what we're doing as well through the uh, uh, various initiatives is actually uh, trying to link up with female administrators in clubs uh, and in the provinces, provide them uh, with leadership programs, um, which we have been doing over the last two years, uh, very effective leadership programs, and trying to encourage uh, uh, women to get involved in the game uh, at an administrative level um, and uh, I would hope that over time we start to see the fruits of that as well um, but certainly the, the intention is to try and increase uh, as, as best we can uh, the administrators or female administrators right across the game not just at IRFU level but at club level and ultimately that's where that's where the people in on the union committee come from they come from the clubs so we need to we need to encourage and need to provide the support uh, structures and need to provide the training uh, to uh, to women who want to get involved in rugby administration at club level and at provincial level so we're, we're making progress are we there yet uh, i think we're on a journey uh, i don't think we're at the end point we're on a journey are you happy, happy with the job that Dave Mace Ford is doing as performance director? Will he be possibly 
Um, I think we're very happy with the job that David Nusifor is doing, uh, and I'm in discussions with him at the moment in terms of contract extension. I think it, all you have to do is, 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 is look at the throughput of uh, players coming into the provincial system um, uh, and, uh, and the, the success that we've had in bringing young players through into the provinces and indeed into the uh, national team. I think the work that he's done on the pathways, which in many respects uh, you know, is maybe not as visible um, for people, uh, I think the support structures uh, in terms of the SNC staff and the pathways, the coaching staff and the pathways, the uh, talent identification programs that have been put in place, all of those things uh, have really um, been put in place and in are initiatives that have been developed by David. Um, I think the performances of the, the national team um, are effectively, you know, the end point, if you like, in terms of the success of the pathways. Uh, uh, and obviously the players and the coaches um, are critical to, to, to that as well. But David's job is to provide the raw material uh, through the high performance system. Um, and I think, uh, I think he's done a really good job. But the men's, men's game you're talking about there. That's the men's game I'm talking about there. In terms of the women's game, we'll go back to the review issue, Sinead, in terms of we need to look at those pathways. A lot of work has been done by Colleen McEntee and, uh, and David and the High Performance Group in relation to trying to reshape those uh, pathways uh, specifically for the women's game. Um, and it's that interface area between club uh, and the high performance system is, is where the pathways lie. And it's really important that we get that right uh, and that we get the access points uh, into that pathway. Uh, right uh, for the for the girls, and as I say, it may look different and be quite different to that that uh, suits the men's game, um, and uh, so there's a lot of work going on uh, in in both aspects of the game. Uh, it's it's not just about the men's game, but in in respect of of the work uh, that's been done in relation to the uh, the, the men's game, uh, I, I think the academy structures have tight have uh, have tightened up. I think the pathway supports have uh, uh, worked really well and I think we're seeing a throughput of, of players through the provinces and thanks to the provinces uh, themselves uh, and their academies but ultimately I think the direction of travel uh, has, been, has been set in many respects uh, by David and that high performance group. Thank you.